Good morning. Welcome to Sandy Hook United Methodist Church, where everyone is welcome, nobody is perfect, and anything is possible. 
We are a Jesus-centered community creating a safe space for all people to be loved, to belong, and to thrive. If you're visiting with us today, we would love to connect with you. If you would fill out a connect card that's found in the pew in front of you, you can drop it in the offering box or hand it to myself or Ron after the service, and we would greatly appreciate it. There's also a care card on the back that you can put any prayer requests that you have. Tuesday is dessert and discussion from 6.30 to 7.30 in the fellowship hall. Join our family discipleship director, Melissa Hatton, in a discussion about ways to better welcome and engage children in the worship at Sandy Hook. Anyone is welcome to attend, and child care is available for ages 0 to 12. Please register at the next step table so we know we have enough desserts, and email Melissa if you have any questions or you would prefer to zoom into the discussion. Saturday is the big night at the fair at the county fair booth. The serving shift is scheduled from 4.30 to 9.45 p.m. And they need help cooking, prepping, and receiving orders, and serving food at the window, taking money at checkout, and cleaning tables. So there's something that anyone can do. Please um, make sure that you sign up for that also at the next steps table. This is a great service opportunity. Uh, there will be an outdoor worship and picnic on July 7th at 11 a.m. Make sure you bring your lawn chairs, and we will have service out here at the side of the church. And afterwards, there will be meat and drinks provided by the church, but make sure that you bring your favorite side or dessert. Vacation Bible School is right around the corner from July 8th through the 10th. You can register online or fill out a paper registration out in the lobby. And this is for everyone, children, grandchildren, friends, neighbors. But to make it work, we have to have violent volunteers. And we have a fun prep night to put it all together. There are sign-ups for all of that at the Next Steps table. For more information on these events and others, it's in your weekly newsletter. If you are not getting the newsletter, please let the office know, and they'll be happy to get you signed up. Today, we will continue our Wrestling with Doubt series sermon series with a message titled when prayers go unanswered as we are called to worship by god may we sense his presence in the midst of our lament our grief our suffering and our hope now please stand for the call to worship Jesus says, knock, and the door will be open. Seek, and you shall find. Jesus says, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. Jesus says, not my will, God, but your will be done.
I was going to go with it, man. Yeah, you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then everybody else would sing in a separate key. Yeah. See, that was intentional. Yes, yes. <laughs> be seated. I am not Pastor Paul. <laughs> Pastor Paul is on vacation. We're happy that he and the family are getting some time away to relax, um, and we'll add him to our, him and the family to our prayer list here in a minute. Uh, at this time, we want to come to God with our offering. Um, you can see on the screen we have many ways that you can give. If you have any questions on those or need assistance with that, please let me know. Please join me for our offertory prayer. Gracious God, as we bring our offerings before you in this Pentecost season, we acknowledge the gift of your grace, freely given and yet calling us to respond. Help us not to accept your grace in vain, but to let it bear fruit in our lives and in our communities. May our actions reflect the transforming power of your grace as we open our hearts to love, to vulnerability, and to relationship, trusting in the abundance of your grace to guide us. Amen. At this time, we're coming together for our prayers and praises. 
anybody that has any updates that uh, you'd like to share, Jennifer will have a microphone. Um, I do want to offer again prayers for uh, Pastor Paul and Stacy and the family as they are out this week, um, hopefully enjoying the beach and Pastor Paul getting plenty of time to read and relax and, and enjoy uh, the time away. Um, I was uh, contacted by a friend of mine this morning who happens to uh, work overseas on a regular basis, and there has been some conflict um, that has been rising in uh, the South China Sea. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's just events occurring in our, in our world that are breaking the shalom that God wants us to have, and uh, we really want to keep uh, the people in that area in our prayers as well. Um, does anybody else have any prayers or praises, any concerns? Um, my boyfriend's family has been struggling with some health issues, particularly his grandpa. His grandpa has been struggling with lung cancer for a while now, and just a few days ago he was diagnosed with a rare form of thyroid cancer, stage four. Uh, so. Hopefully, if treatment goes well, he'll be able to have a normal, a normal life, but a lot of stress with his family. Hi. Um, I would like to ask for prayers for my brother. Uh, I am Fran's sister. You'll always know me as Fran's sister. I have no <laughs> other name, uh, but it really is Dory. Uh, but my, our brother Chuck, he's our oldest sibling. Uh, he is at St. Vincent's right now. Originally, they thought that he had leukemia uh, onset. Uh, he's been, his health has been declining for some time, but uh, I really lift him up in prayer to you. Uh, he is unable to talk, eat, or swallow. However, they say that might be improving, and he can come home Tuesday if he can do that. So if you will be thinking about him this week, we would greatly appreciate it. Also, please continue your prayers for Fran. She had a rocky kind of week this week, nothing terrible, awful, but uh, we are praying for her to regain her strength, and she has a scan coming up very soon. If you'll be praying for that scan, we would appreciate that also. Thank you. And we will continue to pray for Fran. I'd like to request prayer for my friend Jennifer who's sitting here beside me. She's having foot surgery this Friday. It's going to put her out of commission for about a month, so please pray for her. Um, I had asked for prayer for a family friend. Uh, her name's Patsy um, that was put on hospice last week and actually learned right after church that she had passed away Saturday. Um, so just pray for her, their family um, as they grieve. Um, her kids, grandkids, husband, um, and uh, she had ovarian cancer. I think it was like two years, kind of off and on, and just a real quick uh, ending there, and God called her home. Um, and then I also have a friend from high school. Um, he has had brain cancer, um, been struggling with this for probably 15, 20 years, and he had a scan this past week in the tumor's back, so he's having brain surgery for the third time in a year. Um, mid-July. Um, his, his name? name? Tony. Tony. And uh, he wasn't supposed to make it past his 40th birthday when he was first diagnosed, and now he's 41. So already, I think he's counting his blessings. Um, but my heart just goes out to him and his kids and his family. Um, so just pray for all of them, please. We wanted to thank everybody for coming out to Chicago Pizza. It was a good success, and we're looking forward to the cookout coming up to uh, bless several different organizations in the area and uh, help more of those in need. Hi, um, I have a coworker, her name's Taylor. Um, She's expecting her first child. Her due date is technically July 12th, but it's also 95 degrees every day. So uh, the pregnancy's going, going smooth, but if you could just keep her in mind that the birthing process goes easily for her. It's her first child, too. Uh, 
um, my son-in-law was taking his brother to Indianapolis for a heart cath, and it was incomplete. So while they were waiting to reschedule at a different facility, he had a heart attack, and he's now at that original facility. Um, evidently, he's recovering, and um, they expect a full recovery, but it's just, you know, um, that, that its healing will be complete. What was his name? Junior Hadley. Junior? Um, I have a couple of updates. My aunt had a PET scan on Monday, and it was clear. Um, she, she's meeting with a specialist. Um, sorry. Apparently, her type of breast cancer is not the normal type. Um, so it's a praise that it's clear, but she is meeting with a specialist July, July 3rd at the Mayo Clinic. So just prayers that that goes well. Um, my uncle had his devices turned on this week. And they spent more than an hour testing different things with the devices to stop his tremors. And they left in about two hours away from the facility. He started having large whole body movements. So they had to call them. They told him to reduce his medication, um, hoping that that helps. So just, it's going to be a lot of trial and error to figure out the mix between the machine settings and his medications. So just prayers that they can get that figured out and quickly. Uh, also, prayers for me. I'm struggling to work right now. <laughs> Just prayers that God will show me the path he has. We'll pray. <laughs> Are there others? Please join me. Father, we come to you today with joys and concerns. We come to you today with grief and grace. We come to you today with loss and love. Father, we ask that you touch our lives. The illnesses and the sicknesses and the physical ailments and the heart issues and the cancers and Father, we know that you are working to heal not only just the physical ailments, but the world. We know you want the world to be healed. Father, we know that there are issues and problems, personal struggles that we have and interpersonal struggles that we have and international struggles that we have. There's so much Ukraine and Israel and Palestine and China and the Philippines and just all kinds of things that break that peace, Lord. But Father, we know that this is not how you want things to be. We pray for all those illnesses that have been lifted, the surgeries, the scans, Lord, we know that you are working, and you are here, and you are touching our lives, and you are making us whole, and we turn to you, and we lift all of these to you because we cannot carry them alone. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We come together in a moment of silence and reflection.
We pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we have our uh, sermon in a sack. And uh, Melissa is going to come and give that. So if any of the kids want to come up and join. Good morning. Come on up, my friends. How are you? Good. Yes, I remembered. Yeah, you're right. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so Judy Elga brought in our sermon in this sack. I wonder what is in here. It's kind of a cool bag to begin with. So I will open to avoid unnecessary chaos. You are chaos? All right. Ooh. Is it tissues or something's in the tissue? Something's in there. What is it? It is. Huh. Anybody know what this is? It could, looks like it could be an eraser. Yeah, it could be. It's a dude that plays the whiteout. It's a dude that you brought that dude up, and you do this flossy. Yeah, it's floss. You're right. Very good. I have a dentist bag when I lost the floss. You lost the floss at the dentist. How many of you have lost the floss at the dentist? It doesn't ever get home, right? You're like, thanks for the freebie. I'm good. You know. Yeah, so pass that around. Make everybody see it. This is brand new. How do you know? Because this is still on it. Yeah. You have to, this has to be off when it's not brand new. You're right. So you know, like, it's safe to use, right? Yeah. Very cool. So when you see floss... <laughs> How do we connect that to God and to our relationship with him? Any thoughts on that? Um, this floss is kind of like it's still in flapper, but it's kind of like there's no air in it. I love that, Ada. And it would help me to watch Scream better. Yeah. Did everybody hear what Ada said? Or everyone's distracted with Elise's? Hi, Dad. Everybody say hi, Dad. All right, check. Got it. So, Ada, can you say that again, what you thought of when you saw floss and about how that connects to God? So, so kind of because floss is, it's kind of like it never ends because the string is so long. And it kind of connects because um, God's kingdom never ends. Wow. All right. Well, that wraps up Sermon in the Sack. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, I really think that sums it up, and that is a beautiful reminder. And I think it's a beautiful reminder, as Pastor Paul reminds us, that the kingdom is not something that's aloft in the clouds and awaits us when we leave the earth. The kingdom is here, right? And God calls us to bring his kingdom here. Um, and how beautiful is it that we get to be part of that in our brokenness and chaos that we all can bring to that God somehow uses us to bring his kingdom here so thank you Ada for reminding us of that I, all right thank you all right so can we um can we pray together to wrap up our time before you guys go to children's church sound good is Bob the chicken ready too I'm glad he could join and us strawberry penny is ready. and strawberry penny all right cool all right well let's pray and talk to God okay Dear God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for my friends here on stage and for our adult friends out there. And God, I just thank you for Ada reminding us this morning that your, your love is long and your kingdom is huge and never ending. And it just covers us. And um, we just thank you for that. And thank you for sending your son so that we can always be in relationship with you. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.
All right, Misty and Beth are waiting for you guys. And don't forget to floss. Right? Is that the other message here? Is that the message, Judy? <laughs> All right. And Logan, I think, is coming up to read our scripture. Yeah? Cool. <laughs> Tag, you're it. <laughs> scripture today comes from John chapter 14, verse 13 through 17. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Heaven for real? Sometimes we live life in the middle of a storm. Heaven. Where Left is out it? In the open, exposed to the elements. Beyond the clouds? No matter where we look. So, Pastor Paul not being here today means that somebody else is preaching. Today, it's not me. We're doing things a little bit differently, uh, but we do have a word from Pastor Paul. Everyone, grace and peace. I'm not there today. Yeah, that's right. I am on vacation with my family. We're headed to the beach today. Uh, do you like the scenery behind me? Yeah, pretty cool, right? So, good news, we're gonna have a special guest speaker today, Adam Hamilton. He is the pastor of Resurrection Church in uh, Kansas City, and uh, he wrote the book, Wrestling With Doubt, that inspired our sermon series. Now, for the past four weeks, you got to hear my take on some really important questions. Those questions were derived from a survey that uh, Pastor Adam Hamilton did in his church. And so you heard my take on those four questions. Now we get to question number five, uh, dealing with um, what do we do when prayers go unanswered? Or why do prayers go unanswered? Which is an incredibly important uh, question. And today uh, in this video, you'll see Adam Hamilton talking about the complexity of prayer. Now for many of us, we uh, put some pretty big expectations on God to answer our prayers the way that we want him to. But the reality of it is, it's much more complex. And you'll hear about that in the video. And as you watch the video today, I'd like you to reflect upon your own prayer life. The prayers you pray that have been answered, the prayers that you pray that have gone unanswered. And as you go through this today, I pray um, that God will speak to you directly upon where you are in your prayer journey. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pastor Adam Hamilton, 
talking about when prayers go unanswered. Who do you pray for? And even if you don't go to church, even if you have doubts, I've found a lot of folks, even with doubts, spend time praying. But sometimes our doubts are actually the result of praying and finding that God didn't do what we asked God to do. I've known people who felt deep disappointment because the prayers that they had prayed were not answered. And they weren't prayers just for themselves. Often they were prayers for other people. They were prayers that were prayed earnestly. They were prayers that were prayed in faith. They were prayers that were prayed for somebody's recovery from some illness. And when that recovery didn't happen and God didn't do what they were expecting God to do, there's deep disappointment. The other day I was talking with somebody in our congregation and they were sharing with me that, uh, that they had a friend whose son was ill and this friend was convinced. They went to a church that taught that if you had enough faith you know, and enough people prayed that God would do something miraculous. God would heal the person, that, that this was the formula. If you did this, this was going to happen. But you couldn't have any doubt. You needed to make sure that nobody with doubt was around that person. Now, the doctors had said that the likely outcome was that, that her son was going to die. And, uh, and yet she believed and, and desperately wanted to believe what her church had taught. And so she only allowed people to come visit her son in the hospital who had absolute faith that he was going to be healed. Well, there wasn't very many of those folks. There were some but not very many, who, who would say, you know what, I am totally 100% convinced that, that your son is going to be healed. So they got to come. The other family members who had questions about that, who weren't certain, the family members who wanted to be able to prepare and be able to say their goodbyes to uh, her son, they weren't allowed to come to visit. And so there was no opportunity for her son to talk about his feelings, about his own mortality, about the fact that the doctors had said that he wasn't going to survive this. There was no room for that. There was no room for the doctors to come in and to, you know, who, who would talk about any of these things because she was convinced if you prayed hard enough and if you believed hard enough, you know, her son was going to be well. And in the end, of course, her son died and there was uh, disappointment on the part of the family and friends who didn't get to say their goodbyes. But there was deep disappointment for her because what she had believed about prayer didn't happen. So what I'd like to do is talk in our session here a little bit about how prayer, how I think prayer works and, and how we might pray. And in the chapter, you're going to have a chance to read a lot more about this, um, about how prayer in Scripture actually works. So we find Jesus talking about prayer. He often talks about prayer using hyperbole. He talks about if you, you know, whatever you ask for, believing you will receive. Well, whatever? Or is that certain things that he's really talking about? And, uh, and you know, we've all experienced praying for things that didn't actually come to pass in the way that we had hoped. And so we realize that can't be literally what Jesus means. He says, you know, if you have enough faith, you can say to this mountain, be moved into the sea and it will be done for you. But of course, none of us expects that we can actually go to a mountain and tell it to be cast into the sea. And that's going to happen. Jesus is speaking in hyperbole. So last week I was, uh, I heard several testimonies from people, people who sent me their stories who had been addicts, who had struggled with addiction and toxic relationships and mental health issues. And they each described how there came a point where they had said, finally, Jesus, I need help. I can't do this by myself. They began to believe that he loved them, that he cared for them, that he was going to walk with them. They began to sense his presence. They began to talk to him, pray with him, ask for his help in being able to deal with their addictions. And what they found is they found that the chains began to be broken. They found that he began to move mountains in their life. They used this kind of language to describe what happened when they, when they really trusted that God knew them, loved them, that, had, that God had a different plan for their lives. And they began to surrender their lives to God. Mountains were moved. Often, I think, when Jesus teaches us about prayer, he's talking about those kinds of things that we pray for. But we recognize that there's a whole lot of prayers that aren't going to be answered or maybe don't, aren't, well, they're not answered in exactly the way we wanted. Jesus prayed and he prayed for uh, the cup to be taken from him. And yet he also prayed, yet not my will, but thy will be done. All right, when it comes to prayer, I was uh, looking at a study lately. Uh, it just came out earlier this spring. 1,750 adults, I think it was. It was an online study, and, uh, and they found 60% of them prayed. And more younger people, instead of saying they prayed, they meditated or they, they did mindful, mindfulness exercises. 
But of those who prayed, 76% said they prayed for their loved ones, 56% prayed for themselves when they were sick, 20% prayed for their favorite sports team to win, and uh, 45% said that when they prayed, it made them feel less anxious or depressed. 32% said they felt like better versions of themselves when they prayed, and 87% felt like they had had times when prayers were answered. So when you pray, you know, I'm wondering what you pray about and what you pray for. And I find most of the time when I'm praying, I, my prayers for myself are typically, God, here I am. Do with me whatever you want. Lead me, guide me, help me to know your will. Help me to pay attention and to see what you want me to do today in my life. And, and when I have family members or friends, I am praying often when there's some need that they have, I'm praying for them that God will bless them, care for them. For my congregation members, I'm praying for God's care and blessings. I pray when somebody's sick for a grand slam out of the park home run kind of miracle. But part of what I recognize is that's not how God usually works. God usually works in more ordinary means. And that's true in every part of our lives. That, that if we you know, were to pray and expect miracles every time we prayed for healing, we wouldn't need doctors, we wouldn't have hospitals, we wouldn't have nurses, we wouldn't need you know, medical researchers, we wouldn't need to do anything. We just pray and God would miraculously give us what we want. And often we treat God, as I mentioned in the book, like a divine vending machine where we're expecting, if we just say the right prayer in the right way, God's gonna miraculously give us what he wants. But that doesn't seem to be how God usually works. God's usual way of working is in us and through us to meet each other's needs, to be the answer to other people's prayers, or as I mentioned in the book, for us to be the miracle for somebody else. I mentioned in the book uh, a, a woman who came to me and she was deeply disappointed in God because God had not answered her prayers to sell her house. And I just wanna, in case you didn't read the book yet, I do wanna mention that uh, when we pray and we ask God to do something, uh, we need to ask, is what I'm asking God to do actually consistent with the character and the heart of God? She desperately needed her to sell her house for a certain amount so she could pay off all of her debts. And, uh, and she said, Pastor, I'm disappointed in God. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I turned in prayer requests for God to help me sell my house. I need to get this amount of money out of it. She said, I've even gone so far as to buy the, the uh, statue of St. Joseph. And uh, so you may not have heard this, but in, in, uh, not just for Catholics, but for others as well, there's this idea that if you take a statue of St. Joseph, you bury it head first by your real estate sign, and then you pray a certain prayer uh, that St. Joseph is gonna help you to be able to sell your house. This is one of the kits that you can buy online. This is the authentic St. Joseph home sale practice kit. And it's got a plastic statue of St. Joseph. You bury it in the ground head first by where your real estate sign is, and there's a prayer inside. And, and uh, I guess I just have to ask, is that really how prayer works? Is it magic like that? If you just, and if you pray to the saints, will they, will they take care of things for you? And what this woman found is it did not work the way she had hoped. Now, of course, there are people who sold their houses, and so they say, yes, it was, you know, it was the kit that got that done. But for this woman, it still didn't get the job done. And I asked her, I said, so tell me, you know, how much are you trying to sell your house for? And she told me, and I said, how does that compare with comparable sales in your neighborhood? And she said, well, it's, it's on the high side. And I said, well, how much on the high side? And it was like $20,000 more than comparable sales, you know, houses like hers that sold for in the neighborhood. And I said, what condition is your house in? Is it in, a, is it in just awesome condition? She said, no, it, it needs some work. I just didn't have the money to fix it up. And I said, so you're praying that God will bring someone to your house who will pay more than market value for a house that's worth less than market value because it needs work done to it. They're gonna have to put some money into it. And uh, she kind of paused for a moment and I said, does that sound like the thing that God would do? That God would, you know, because you prayed, he would cause someone else to get a, not a great deal on a house that they were gonna have to do some work on. And, and she said, yeah, I, maybe that's not really how God works. And I said, I don't think that's how God works. And when she priced her house according to the you know, market conditions, she sold it pretty quickly. And uh, that I think is part of what we need to recognize when it comes to our disappointment in prayer. So. Often, I, I mention in the book this idea of ora et labora. Ora et labora comes out of the Catholic and Anglican traditions, and it means pray and work. Ora is prayer, and labora is work. Pray and work. So in this tradition, you pray, and then you get to work doing the very thing that you're praying for. So Harry Emerson Fosdick once said, one of the great preachers of the first half of the 20th century, said, prayer fixes our hearts. It's not about changing God's heart. It's not about you know, helping advise God on how to run the universe. Prayer is changing our hearts so that whatever we're praying for, we focus our heart on that. And so if we're praying for somebody who's sick, that's meant to lead us to a deeper love and compassion for that person. And then to ask, what can I do to help them? How can I care for them? What more, you know, what more might I do to be the hands and the feet of Jesus for them? 
And, uh, and so when I think about this, this idea of or at labora, whatever I'm praying for, I'm also asking, what can I do to be a part of the answer to those prayers? So I also think about unanswered prayer, and we t- I talk about this in the, in the book, but I have to mention this as you're looking at me face to face. So I think about the times that I've had unanswered prayers, and, and I think about Garth Brooks' song, you know, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. And that song, I've, I have lived that song. I remember when I was in high school, I had a girl, I was madly in love with her. Oh my gosh, I was head over heels over this girl. And I don't know if I was in love with her. I certainly had uh, a strong emotional attraction to her. And uh, we were dating for a, a short period of time. And, and then she broke up with me. And you know, I had prayed. I thought she might be the one, you know, she was gonna be the one. She broke up with me, my heart was broken. Oh my gosh, I was at work when she broke up with me. I was working at Hardee's, a you know, fast food restaurant, and she broke up with me through the drive-through. And I went in the back employee break room and I just cried and my supervisor came in and he sat with me while I was crying, you know, and, and, uh, and I thought, you know, God didn't answer my prayers. I thought she was the one. Well, here's the deal. God's not gonna make some girl or some boy love you if they don't wanna love you right? How fair would that be if God made you love somebody else? So she broke up with me. But, you know, it wasn't long after that, that the girl who was actually my best friend in youth group, that I began to, I began to see, you know, how much I loved her and our friendship. And eventually I asked her out, actually I had a friend ask her out for me because I was too afraid to ask her out. I asked her if she'd go on a date with me. And uh, we began to date and I, I found I was so smitten with her and I grew in a deep friendship and love with her. And you know, 41 years after we got married, I'm still smitten with her, maybe more than the day we got married. And so I can look back and think on the things that I had prayed for with this other girl, how grateful I am that God didn't answer that prayer because I wouldn't have my two daughters and my granddaughter and and so much beauty in my life had God answered the prayer that I'd asked for when I was 15 years old. And this is true in a lot of ways when my parents were getting divorced and I just, you know, I, I prayed that God would make my parents stay married, right? Like. God's gonna make them stay married. But that was my prayer as a, as a kid. I was actually, I was 14, 13 or 14, and uh, didn't really understand how prayer worked, but that was my prayer. And then my parents got divorced anyway. And my heart was broken and I was sad. And if I'd had any faith before that, it was pretty much gone by the time my parents got divorced. And I, you know, I thought God didn't answer my prayer. And, and that was interesting, you know, my mom ended up marrying my stepdad and my stepdad and mom sold the house and he was a builder and we moved to another part of town. And, and in that other part of town, somebody came and knocked on my door and invited me to come to church. And when I went to church, I met this cute girl at church and, and, uh, and I started going to church. And after a while, I started reading my Bible. And then one night, you know, I got down on my knees next to my bed and I gave my life to Christ. And at that church, when I was 16, somebody said, I think you ought to be a pastor someday. And the pastor invited me to preach the sermon. And, I felt called to ministry there. And, you know, I'm, I'm here today as a pastor and author of the book that you've read, in part because God didn't answer my prayer for my mom and dad to get back together again. And so part of what I've learned over time is you look back and you see, it's not that God is, you know, intentionally not answering your prayer so something better can happen. It's that God knows that he's able to work through the pain and the brokenness in our lives and he redeems it and he brings something good and beautiful from it. And, uh, and he knows you know, that, that in the future, there will be things that happen in your life that you're gonna look back and go, thank you, God, that you didn't answer that prayer. And so I've come to trust that whatever happens in my life, that God is able to redeem the pain, and that often the most painful things that happen in my life are the things that shape me most profoundly and, and, and ultimately result in the things that I think are most, I mean, if anything's beautiful in my life, I think it partly came out of the pain in my life. So in the scriptures we read in the book of Isaiah that God gives us beauty for ashes and joy for sorrow and a spirit of praise for the heaviness in our lives and he makes us oaks of righteousness. And so when I think about prayer, I'm less focused on God fixing everything in my life and more focused on thanking God for what is in my life, yielding myself to God and then seeking to be the answer to somebody else's prayers. So I wanna encourage you to be people of prayer. Be part of that 60% who pray every day and when you pray, Remember that prayer tunes your heart towards the things you're praying for. And in prayer, we are offering ourselves to be the answer to someone else's prayers and the prayers that we're praying. And in the process of doing that, I think you'll find a peace that passes all understanding to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So would you pray with me right now? And I'm gonna invite you just to pray out loud the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope that you appreciated that sermon from Adam Hamilton. The big idea from the message today is this. Prayer is not about changing God's mind, but about aligning our hearts with God's will. Prayer is not about changing God's mind, but about aligning our hearts with God's will. As so a prayer is more about uh, our transformation, about God transforming us into love. And in the reality, we can be the answer to other people. So as we pray, we become more and more connected to the heart of God and we care about the things that God cares about, the people that God cares about. And so God is transforming us into love as we pray. Now, one of the things I loved about uh, the video from Adam Hamilton was his conversation about prayer and work. In other words, we pray for miracles, we pray for God to intervene, we pray for God to work in these situations, but as we are praying, we are working alongside our prayers to be the answer to our prayers. We are taking care of those who are hurting around us. We are uh, sending food or a card or to those who are hurting. We are actively involved, in loving others, loving everyone always. Um, a few next steps for this message today. Uh, number one, I'd like you to reflect upon your own prayer life about how your heart aligns with God's will, and maybe to reflect upon the areas in which your heart does not align with God's will. Secondly, um, look uh, to be the answer to other people's prayers. Look for opportunities to meet needs, to love others, and to be the answer to other people's prayer. And third, uh, trust, even though trust uh, that God is working, even though it might appear that He isn't. Trust is a choice. So we have faith uh, in God that God is working in these situations. We trust Him uh, that He is bringing beauty from ashes and joy from sorrow. So I'm going to invite you to take your next step uh, today from the message that we heard. Would you uh, join me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for the message that Pastor Adam brought to us today. And Lord, I pray for all of us as we have reflected upon our own prayer lives and our own prayer and times in which our prayers are answered the way that we want them. And of course, all the times we've prayed and things haven't turned out the way we want. Lord, I pray that we would align our hearts with your heart. I pray for Sandy Hook United Methodist Church that we, as we practice the grace habit of prayer, that, Lord, you would transform us more and more and more into love, that we would become like your son Jesus more and more, and that we would be more loving and more caring to those around us, especially those who are on the margins, those who are alone, those are, who are uh, disconnected from any church or any family or anyone. So, Lord, as we continue on our journey this week, Lord, I pray that you would ignite a passion in our lives for prayer, not to get the things that we want, but to rather align our hearts with your heart. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let us stand together for our closing song. Grace and peace.
I offer now the benediction. Go now and pray boldly and open your heart to God. May you be the answer to another's prayer. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful day.